today we're going to show our customers how to properly mix and use the Embon 600 with one of our advanced sensor transducer gauges. Okay. I want to show you the proper technique for, or I want to show them the proper technique for mixing it. If you'll go ahead and take the shipping seals off both the bottles. Notice one of the bottles has date mixed on it. Since this has a two week pot life, we need to know when we mixed it, so we need to know when to throw it away. So we're going to pour this material into this glass or jar, remove the caps, and discard those. Noting the one with the box for date mixed is here. He's going to take his funnel, he'll slightly tilt that so the air has a path to escape, and he'll pour in the curing agent making sure he gets all of both in together. He'll dispose of that bottle and the funnel. Those are both considered contaminated now, and we will not reuse those. And now becomes the most challenging part. He's going to put the brush cap applicator inside the bottle, and he's going to shake it for about 15 seconds. Now, this material has to ingest for a minimum of 30 minutes, and we prefer an hour before you use it, so we're, going, we're mixing it now, and we'll come back here in a few minutes and bond the strain gauge. One thing we have to be sure to do though is put the date mixed so we know when to uh, remove the material or discard the material. Today is the 8th of March. There's the mixing. Okay, so we've now waited the minimum of 30 minutes, uh, recommended one hour of ingestation period for the Embon 600. We're now going to finish the surface preparation for our beam and bond the gauge. Now the Embon 600 is typically used in uh, solvent thinned applications where a bond line of thin and hard and repeatable is necessary. We're going to be using an advanced sensor type strain gauge, a transducer class gauge for this application. So Colin, first thing we got to do is get rid of the degrease or the, mm -hmm. any contaminants on there. So we're going to degrease it with the CSM3. It's going to take a dry gauze sponge, spray the CSM3 into the gauze sponge, and then degrease the entire surface. Next step, he's going to locate the 400 grit silicon carbide abrasive paper and he's going to pull off a, a strip of that and he's going to dry a braid with the 400. Just eight or ten strokes back and forth. It's not critical. We're just getting rid of the loose contamination. And in fact, this particular beam had been tumbled, so this might be a redundant step. Next step, take another piece of the 400 grit silicon carbide abrasive paper using the conditioner A, the mild phosphoric acid solution. We're going to wet a braid with the 400 grit silicon carbide abrasive paper. Be sure the, the conditioner A is flooded on the surface. You don't want it to dry out while you're abrading. Ten or twelve strokes is sufficient. He'll then take a clean, dry gauze sponge and with a single wiping motion absorb the material off the beam. We don't wipe back and forth because that'll redeposit contamination. All right, next step, we'll take the conditioner A and a cotton tip applicator and we're going to scrub the surface of the beam. This is going to get any of that loose material that you've uh, abraded away and going to uh, remove it for or scrub it from the surface. Having completed that scrubbing, take another clean dry gauze sponge, fold it into quarters, and with a single wiping motion absorb that material. The final step of surface preparation will be using the Neutralizer 5A. It's an ammonia solution to bring the pH back to either a neutral or slightly basic condition. So you're going to put a, a slug of the uh, Neutralizer 5A on there and using a cotton tip applicator he's going to scrub the surface of his beam. He'll turn the cotton tip applicator over and look at it and see if it came out clean. He apparently chose that it was going to be clean. 
I'm going to use a single gauze sponge and absorb the excess material. He's now going to set his beam somewhere out of harm's way. We'll take our glass plate and using the Neutralizer 5A and a clean dry gauze sponge, he's going to scrub that plate to remove any contamination. Glass plate is good because it's easy to see if it's dirty and easy to get it clean. He'll also clean the business end of his blunt nose tweezers as those he'll be using to handle the gauges. Again, a little neutralizer 5A into a gauze sponge and he cleans those the business end of his blunt nose tweezers. Blunt nose tweezers for gauges, pointed tweezers for wires and manipulating things. Now we're going to open up the gauge package and using our blunt nose tweezers, having pulled the gauges out of the plastic pouch, he'll splay open that acetate folder and if you'll notice he's going to grab the gauge by the tab end. If we grab it by the, the uh, grid end, there's a possibility that we'll damage that grid during the install. He'll now lay that shiny side up. Notice there's a shiny side and a dull side to your gauge. He'll lay that shiny side up on the, uh, on the uh, glass plate. He'll then take a piece of the MJG2 tape, the Mylar tape with a silicon mastic, and he's going to cover just the tab end of the gauge. And the reason for this is we don't want the adhesive wicking up onto the tabs and we also want to give the, that adhesive a path for the solvents to escape. So there'll be three free sides on the gauge with the tape just running across the end of the gauge covering the tabs. He'll now, at a shallow angle, lift that off of his uh, glass plate, transfer it to his beam, there you go, making sure it's properly aligned and then he'll expose the bonding surface of the gauge. He might crease that tape with his tweezers or his uh, something uh, to manipulate it. He's now going to locate the Embon 600 that has had an ingestation period of a minimum of a half an hour and typically we recommend an hour. He's going on the inside of the neck of the bottle he's going to hit it one time and then he's going to brush over the back side of the gauge, the bonding side of the gauge. He'll just wet that. He'll then reapply, get some more adhesive and on the inside of the neck of the bottle and where the gauge is going to land. He puts a layer of adhesive. Now watch what happens when he lifts the, the brush. See how that makes that little puddle? You want that puddle to be over here and not underneath the gauge. And now we wait a minimum of five minutes of air dry time. Five minutes minimum, 30 minutes maximum. The reason we have these minimum and maximums is one, we want the solvents, 90% of them to evaporate away before we put the gauge down and seal it up. Also, the long term, the, the 30 minutes is, we don't want to leave it exposed too long because moisture in the air and debris and dust and that sort of thing will contaminate your bond line the longer you leave it exposed. So we're going to wait our five minutes. Okay, so now we've waited our full five minutes of air dry time. If you'll watch what Colin's going to do, he's now going to reposition the gauge with his gauge handling tape. He'll locate a piece of the Teflon film, the TFE1, and two pieces of the Mylar tape to tape that down, one on either end. The size of these pieces of tape will be dictated by the um, uh, amount of material you have, the, the Teflon film and that sort of thing. He'll pull it so that there's no wrinkles. Now he's going to take his silicon gum pad and his aluminum backing plate Place those over the top of the gauge, centering it over the gauge. And then he's going to take a Hargrave clamp and he's going to clamp it up. Special attention must be paid for even clamping. So he's going to look down the end of the beam and look at the two beams themselves, the beam and the, the backing plate, 
and make sure that both of those are parallel to one another. We're now going to put this clamped up uh, installation into the oven. A minimum cure te temperature of 175 degrees Fahrenheit for four hours is the minimum. You cannot go below that. You can go above it and cure it faster, but the minimum is 175 degrees Fahrenheit for seven hours, or excuse me, for four hours. And that is bond line temperature. If you have a large spring element or a heavy part, it might take it a long time to get to that 175 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, you should note that the ramp rate should be somewhere between 5 and 20 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. If it's too slow, you'll have a thick or uneven bond line. It's too fast. It will cure around the edges and trap solvents and have voids or discontinuous behavior. If you have a massive part, you might have to put it into a warm oven. If you've got a thin part like this piece of aluminum, you need to start with a cool oven and be sure the ramp rate is again between that 5 and 20. So Colin, let's throw it in the oven. All right. 